Welcome back, everybody. So um, as part of our Missing Episodes Time Space Visualizer event today, um, I'm very, very lucky to be introducing to you um, David Trout. And David, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? And I hope everyone who's watching is very well, too, in this horrible time. It is. It's um, very unknown. It's very unusual. Um, and I think we're, we're facing some times that we didn't think we would be. Um, You've joined us actually as part of our Time Space Visualizer event, which is an opportunity to live stream um, a, a, a Doctor Who convention effectively out all around the world for all of our fans. Um, we did one um, last week and it was a tremendous success. We had quite a lot of uh, very good feedback as part of it. Um, so we thought good. we'd do it all again with a missing episode slant this, this time out. So um, you're welcome, uh, welcome to see Thank you. heavens for the internet. <laughs> well, it's keeping us all sane, I think it's fair to say. Um, that and probably a little bit of alcohol somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, realistically, we're here to talk about missing episodes. So um, it would be remiss of me if I didn't go all the way back to your very first Doctor Who, um, which was a, a, a fleeting appearance, it's fair to say, on The Enemy of the World, which is a recently rediscovered story for us in the world of Doctor Who. Um, what do you remember a bit? Um, I remember it, I think I did it in my school holidays. Um, I loved, I'd always loved going to um, recording studios, television recording studios. Um, and so to actually be involved in it was fantastic, I remember. It sort of, you know, made up my mind about what I wanted to do. So, yeah, I mean, I remember my father being really helpful and kind and yeah he was uh, it was it was a lovely experience was it your first television uh, no um i had appeared as a schoolboy in a ken taylor play lovely writer ken taylor no longer with us unfortunately um in an armchair theater it was a series of um they used to do proper plays in an evening and um, this was with Richard Pascoe and I, I had the immortal line KV Fanny which is my first professional um, line so <laughs> KV <laughs> being the Latin for lookout and Fanny being the nickname that we called our schoolmaster it was a story about a, a put-upon schoolmaster who won the pools and then realized he hadn't sent the letter. So he didn't get any money. So yeah, it was a, it was a sort of lighthearted play, but I was about 11 then, yeah. That I mean, was my only. I mean, you were born into a theatrical family, it's fair <coughs> to say, um, one, of, one of some notoriety. Um, was there pressure from, from the get-go to, to become um, part of the, the sort of showbiz or was it something that was in- Absolutely in not, no. Um, in actual fact, I, I wanted to be a stuntman for a long time. As I said, I used to go and see Dad in uh, studios, various studios, and I met uh, the lovely Peter Diamond once. He was King Stuntman of the BBC. And um, that sort of got me onto the path that I, I fancied falling about and getting hit and various things. That soon went, of course. Um, and then I did a school production. I, I remember about the same time that um, I appeared in my first Doctor Who. So all in all, it was, it, I just fell into it, really. I, I had no pressure at all. I realized how difficult it was going to be. Um, but of course, having a, you know, a parent in the actual profession is either it, it sort of, you get a more real view of what you're going into. How, how aware were you as you were growing up of um, the, the fame of your father, really, more than anything else? Uh, very aware, but especially Doctor Who. I mean, as you know now, um, my father started another family, basically, in 55. So um, <clears throat> we saw him regularly. Um, but yes, of course, I mean, people would come up to us all the time and say, you know, what's it like? You must be very rich and various things like that, which is utterly ludicrous because probably having two families was as poor as a church mouse. 
but um, yeah, I mean, very aware, and it, we, we got quite used to it, really, seeing him in uh, various things. I mean, after he finished Doctor Who, I think he did some of his finest work on television, because he was always, always saying, don't get typecast, you mustn't be in anything for too long, otherwise you'll be typecast in one role. Um, which now is ridiculous because if you are in one role and recognised as such, you seem to get much more work. Yes, the times have certainly changed. I mean, he, yeah. I mean, he obviously did go on, and you're quite right. He did some of the mm. great stuff, but he's all and always has been very, very fondly remembered for his three years on Doctor Who. I mean, the convention circuits opened up, and obviously that gave him a, a, a different lease in his later years, I suppose, as well. He's, he's very fond of attending conventions. Absolutely. Very unlike him. I mean, I was really surprised that he was going to do this. But, um, yeah, he suddenly had a change of heart to open out and uh, be a personality rather than the enclosed figure that he he pretended to be, I think. He, he was a very private man, and not a lot of people knew all about... Um, you know, our family history. He famously turned down um, This Is Your Life about four times. Um, so, yeah, he wanted to keep acting and private life very, very separately. So when he, you know, made the decision to get on to the convention circuit, um, yeah, it was a bit of a surprise. And um, he always seemed to have a, a great on-screen camaraderie with the, the sort of co-stars that he worked with, with uh, Debbie yes, Martin he loved and, and uh, Fraser Hines <laughs> in particular. Um, yeah. Were they great friends of his outside of the programme? Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, Fraser is... Um, I, I often meet him at various events. And, um, I mean, it's still... I think he's really sad that he's not there still. Because um, those two really had such a good time it was um it was fantastic and it, it showed in the actual recordings i think it did it most certainly did come across um i'm sure that uh, that you got to see them quite regularly i suppose uh, as as he was just, as he was in doctor who particularly if you were going to the studios uh, uh, regularly mm -hmm. yeah yeah um shepherd's bush was where they used to do it live well not live but recorded it and then almost immediately went out um yeah i mean it was like a a, a company a close-knit company mm -hmm. it's it's such a shame actually that um you, you, your father's stories are some of the worst that are affected by the losses in the in the archives um out of the missing episodes mm. in particular and and you know for when we had when we had um both web of fear and the enemy of the world returned for us uh, Weber Fee has always been a bit of a, a holy grail of Doctor Who. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely up there in many people's top five um, stories. But Enemy of the World became a bit of a surprise to everyone because we only had one missing episode up until that point. And when the other uh -huh. five came back, Enemy became almost like a classic in its own right. Um, and it, it was a great opportunity to see some of the way that um, Patrick approached a lot of the role. It was very lighthearted very whimsical almost and you know you get the scene at the beginning of the story where he's running into the sea um so it was yeah. a great showcase for us to see i think that episode or that story yeah when it came back well it, it was lovely for me because i read the uh, the book i narrated the book and um trying to do his questionable accents <laughs> <laughs> yes the salamander accent salamander yes yeah um no he he really enjoyed that one because it you know it was spreading his wings and proving what a you know lovely character actor he was mm. yes i mean it's not very often you get to play two parts in the same story particularly in Doctor no, but, um, no. Uh, again we didn't really get to see a lot of it in the only remaining episode so when the, when the story was um found by phil morris and, and was returned it was a real eye-opener for a lot of us and it was almost like almost a little mini mini film to a degree with all the underground caverns and all the, the sort of things that are going on um, around it so um, a real nice story and, and one that I'm particularly fond of that's been found. And, I mean, um, sorry I beg your pardon but uh, very of the moment with um, 
it's uh, you know the earth being ruled and um suddenly we're all in lockdown and i mean of course necessarily but um you know it's just a short step isn't it it certainly is I, realize, I think you realize it when we find ourselves in the situation that we're in um yeah. a lot of the, you, the the stories now from from your father's era are coming back now to us as as animation so we still have the soundtracks and it's quite interesting, actually, that um, there's a renaissance at the moment that we've had just recently the Faceless Ones. We've had the, the Moon Base recently, uh, Macra Terra. We've got uh, Fury from the Deep coming. There's quite a number of his stories now that are coming back to life. And I think that's a really nice thing as well, um, that we can yeah. really enjoy those stories. Well, they made a cartoon, didn't they, of one of them mm -hmm. um, using the soundtrack, which is a good idea. It is a very good idea. Um, and, you know, it gives us as close to what the actual finished thing would have been like, I suppose, as, as best it could. Um, you came yeah. back in Doctor Who um, for the War Games. How did that come about? Um, well, I think it was one of his last ones. <laughs> it was. And it, yeah, so um, I think it was just, again, um, there's a little part here for you, if you would like to do it. Um, can't remember how old I was. I looked very young. I know that. Um, whether I, I don't think I left school. Maybe in my last year, probably. Um, yes, and that was a nice little role to have. Um, I think I was a member of Equity, so I was legal then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yes, it was with Philip Maddock, wasn't it? Yes, um, it was. Names that to conjure with from the past. Yeah. Oh, and such a such a fabulous actor, um, Philip, in his own right. Um, yeah, the way he completely underplayed the sort of strength of the role that he was he was playing. It was just this, yeah. uh, uh, respect yeah. to him for that. Was there was there a sense as you were in, on that story with with Patrick that? Um, it was his last story was there was there sort of mixed emotions on set with this i think so i think you must remember the way they recorded it um was very very tiring for him um he, he would only have about six weeks off in the year so um it was like doing weekly rep really but for television and as you know, in my brother's book, is he's talked about, you know, he, he was very impatient with the script. Some of the scripts he didn't think were very good. And so he was having to spend time rewriting, you know, as they were rehearsing, which is, you know, that is tiring in itself. Um, and quite honestly, I think, you know, he gave every, every time he appeared, he gave all of himself to it, um, which I don't know, might have hastened his early demise, I think, because he really took everything seriously. He had this outward persona of, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, all that shouting in the evening, as he called theatre. Um, lovely story when I, <laughs> I'd been out of work um, for a bit and, um, Suddenly, I, I did an audition for the RSC and got into the Royal Shakespeare Company and I phoned him up and um, I said, oh, by the way, I've, I've got a job. I'm, I've got a year with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And there was a pause and he said, well, don't worry, something else may turn up. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah, his legend about theatre. He was a very good theatre actor. He just didn't like doing everything anything for a long time i think so he, he, much pref was he preferred the immediacy of television yeah so the yeah, i was to say the preference was more for television and the, the sort of in, yes. do a few weeks rehearsal yeah. present once and out yeah and he would i mean in his early days when he did theater he would physically be sick with nerves so that was another thing but he, he felt comfortable with television he was in it right from the start he was sort of you know he developed his style with the development of television i think mm -hmm. and uh, doctor who really shows his communicative skills across the lens i think 
Yes, very much so. When you're in the lead role in something like that, I think it's um, it does take an actor of a certain stature, and certainly um, Patrick had that in spades. It's fair to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. You came you came back and did another Doctor Who after the War Games, and did? Uh, you came back and had a, an opportunity to work with John Pertwee yeah. on um, the Curse of Peladon. Now, obviously, a much bigger role for you. Peladon, yes, my young juvenile lead. Yes. <laughs> Uh, in purple thigh-length suede boots, I remember. Indeed. Very impressive. <laughs> Very impressive, yes. <laughs> and a wig, yeah. Dressing up to the hilt, I called it, yes. No, so that by, was... By, by this time, the series had sort of moved on. Um, it wasn't It wasn't quite as fast and as furious as the sort of black and white days that um, well, it, yes. Patrick enjoyed. Um, but... Um, obviously a different feel to the program was that immediately obvious to you sorry did different feel to the program at that stage with john um yes um i mean john was completely different but he was utterly professional and very welcoming um lenny main the lovely lenny main directed it um he's no longer with us but um yeah and uh um Hepesh, what was his name? Uh, Toon, Jeffrey Toon. He was lovely. They were all so helpful because I, you know, I was pretty inexperienced um television wise. It was probably my biggest role so far. Um but I remember how helpful everyone was. And Katie, of course, Katie Manning. <laughs> yeah. Who I saw the other day. Yes. And she's she's no less fabulous now <laughs> than she's ever been. <laughs> Yeah. And we had a lovely message yeah, from her. Nice. We had a lovely message from her at the last event, actually, which was really nice. So, um, yeah. Um, and I suppose you walk into a rehearsal room on something like um, Doctor Who, and you walk in for the first time, and it's a set cast, and you're you're sort of in as a guest artist for the week. There's always that sort of intrep. There's always that sort of trepidation that it's going to be a, a warm cast or a good cast to be with. So clearly, absolutely you've got that from day one. Yeah. So whenever I'm in it in something that you know i'm a regular in something i always always make sure that everyone hopefully feels welcome because there's nothing worse than going into a room where people who've done it for weeks on end say and you're you've got a few lines it's it, it's a nightmare it's a nightmare um but yeah to welcome people and but after all you know we're all in it together a whole film unit is is not only the actors um it's everyone and so yeah let's all enjoy it together rather than being la di da or you know difficult and that's as it should be i always think and of course agador don't forget from the curse of peladon <laughs> the big shaggy beast there the shaggy beast yes i can't remember there was a stuntman who was in it what was it? terry terry, terry. terry. Terry Walsh, yes. I'm very good with names. Um, no, and uh, lovely Sonny, who played um, an ice warrior. I saw him the other day. He's 90, 90 odd, still signing autographs. It's he's amazing. Is, um, amazing. He's still trooping very, very well. And, you know, he's such a gentle giant of a, of a, of a man yeah, as well, isn't absolutely. he? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, Izan Churchman who um, was played Arcturus, or the voice of Arcturus. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't inside the, the uh, box. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what else do I remember? I remember there was a scene um, in our big hall, underground hall, with lots of um, flames on the walls, flambeaux alight. And there was a big battle scene, I remember. And one of the extras, <laughs> right in the middle of a take, said, Oh, look out, mind the fire! <laughs> right out loud. Which stopped the whole thing, and we had to start again. Um, was... And you, you're one of the few actors who's, who's actually bridged the gap between um, classic and, and new Who as well, of course, um, appearing in uh, an episode with uh, David Tennant, Midnight. Yes, Midnight, which I, I well, I, I think that was a, a brilliant story. 
Um, I'm biased, of course. <laughs> um, we took two weeks to film it, and we all got a bit stir crazy in that little shell of a spaceship. But we had a great time, big laugh, um, because you never saw the monster. It was all in the imagination, just the tap, tap, tapping on the outside. And uh, in actual fact, um, I, well, I was lucky to be in it because um, Sam, oh, I can't remember, it's Sam. Oh, anyway, he had an accident. Um, he was going to play the professor. I'll get the name in a minute. Um, and uh, he got run over in the Strand. With uh, He was about to start filming that. And so, unluckily for him, but luckily for me, I took over the role. And I did send him a card and said, thanks for the part. Hope you're well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very courteous. So, it's happenstance, isn't it? Life is throws up these little hiccups for people yeah and it's it's kind of nice though that you've been able to i think have have a, have a piece in both and again it just sort of keeps that sort of doctor who link for you i think as you come through your career I and mean, obviously it's it's not a large part but it is still in it etched in there particularly with the family background i suppose as well yes absolutely and as i say i i read a few you know doctor who stories um and one i actually played the robot version of my father so i didn't actually play him i i was the, his robot double um and lots of people have always said well would you like to you know would you like to do it i i'm quite honestly i wouldn't know because you know i couldn't follow that no Did it, I, i'm sure it felt quite strange even just doing the robot version as well yes it was um with Tom Baker, that was, yes. Um, but I, it's funny listening to it. Um, you can, when, when I'm reading the stories, say, and I have to be the doctor, um, it's, it's not, it's just a, a style of delivery he had as the doctor that I try and pick up. I don't try and, you know, vocally sound like him, but just his, um, sharpness in his delivery and things you try and you know just to try and get nearer the character yeah and obviously um you've um it's fair to say had a a, a reasonable career within the um within the realms of um uh the theater and particularly around shakespeare and uh, i have indeed yes and um well, when when was your first shakespeare what was the first shakespeare you performed I performed on television. It was um, the uh, BBC, Cedric Messina, uh, Messina, uh, wanted to do the whole canon. And I was in a production of Henry VIII playing the surveyor, who had an impossibly long, impenetrable speech. Um, and so that was my first attempt at Shakespeare. And then in 81... I joined the RSC for the first time, and well, the rest is history. Really, I've I've been there on and off, and now I'm a an honorary associate artist, which I'm very proud of. You so. are indeed, and, and should be. In yeah. fact, I watched a I watched a, a clip of you not long after you'd received that, uh, and you were you were doing an interview, and um, I could tell there you were quite proud of that for sure. It's yeah, good. yeah. I mean, you know, it has its critics and, you know, things have changed, but um, I think Shakespeare is so important um, to keep alive and to make fresh and to, because the language is wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. It's poetry, after all, basically. And, um, and could you pinpoint a favourite production that you've been in over the years? <laughs> Um, yes, um, two. Uh, the Tempest with Alec McCann and Simon Russell Wheel played Ariel and I played Caliban. Uh, directed by Sam Mendes. Uh, that was a wonderful production, I thought. And uh, the uh, Richard II with Sam West playing Richard II. And I played Bolingbroke and then went on to play Henry fourth um 
with Michael Atbro directing, but it was in a very small space and a row, uh, just a bank of seats in the other place, a very oblong theater, very simple. And uh, I actually, in the play, I get the audience to stand up to acknowledge that I am now king. And I would wait there until everyone did. And it sometimes took, you know, three minutes. And I'm uh, very proud in saying I got Prince Charles to stand up to when he came to see it. So. Oh, there's a commanding quite... performance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you prefer the smaller intimate sort of in the round type theatre? I do. Yes, although I'm, I've been told I'm very suited to the large theatre. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm filming, my, my note is always just a little less, David. Just a little less. I do like big spaces, and I, um, but the intimacy is, is good, so it, it teaches me to calm down a bit. But um, in a big theatre, you have to be... You have to use a vocal energy, a thought energy, and you know, you've got to get right to the back of the theatre. And I, I think we're losing that a bit in in productions and, and plays. Plays are not written um, in a grand style anymore. No. No. And of course, we're, we're changing our viewing habits are changing almost to a degree as well. Um, and oh, yes. Course, we're now streaming recording. live into cinemas occasionally. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, um, <laughs> I've, I've been, <laughs> it's one of my bugbears, actually. But not that the fact they record it, but the fact that it's live. Why make it live for a start? Because it is a nightmare to do. It is one of the most frightening things to do. Because, you know, you've got an audience with you in the theatre and you feel an intimacy. But you know half the audience aren't there for the recording because um, for the live show because it's taken up with cameras. So if you're doing a comedy, that's hopeless because you've got half the people laughing. Um, and also I think it's a short step to doing live theatre and we all sit at home. We don't have to go out, which at the moment is probably <laughs> the only way we're going to see theatre. So that shoots my idea down. But uh, you know what I mean, that um, I think in normal times, to go to a theatre, to make the effort to be part of that night in the actual theatre is, uh, is something special. It is. It's something that uh, I much prefer to be live in a theatre. There's nothing more like yeah. the intensity of a production, I think, yeah. when, you're, when you're sitting in the audience. Um, it's at this point I'd normally throw to an audience and ask if there were any questions from the audience, <laughs> but unfortunately we don't have one um, because of our current circumstances. Um, it's been well, an absolute... Email Sorry. them in. <laughs> Sorry? Email them in. Yes. Well, indeed. I mean, do you know, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, time is defeating us um, a little bit, but it's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks very much for you giving up some time to... Well, come thank you. ...our special Time Space Visualizer event uh, about the missing episode. Yes, well, good luck with it. And... Everyone, please stay well and stay at home. <laughs> Thanks very much, David. Really appreciate it. Bye, Jason. Thank you.